You're listening to Setting Course, an ABS podcast. Join us as we navigate the latest trends, developments, and challenges facing the rapidly evolving maritime and offshore industries. Catch every episode at www.eagle.org and podcast platforms everywhere. Today, we're going to discuss the first of a new kind of OSV designed for space support. Joining us for the discussion are Tyson Breedlove. Tyson is the manager, business development global offshore at ABS, and Brian Dietz. Uh, Brian is master of the MS Voyager for Space Perspective. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Tyson, why why don't you uh, kick us off and tell us a little bit about yourself before we we jump into uh, our podcast today. Thanks, John. Uh, Happy to be here. I've been in the industry for about 16 years. I spent my first nine years of my career doing new construction surveys for compliance in uh, South Korea. And from there, I moved to Singapore, where I surveyed uh, marine and offshore assets for compliance units that were in service. And so um, I was there for three years. Uh, Probably most interesting is working in some of the biggest, most sophisticated shipyards in the world. You see the most state-of-the-art technology being applied at a scale that you just don't see anywhere else uh, the way that they build these ships and they do it so quickly and so organized. They know where every piece of the puzzle is and it just all comes together. It's really professionally rewarding to see that product and go out on the sea and be a part of the sea trial and be a part of the team helping the owner and helping the shipyard get the unit to a place where it's fully compliant. And now I work in Global Offshore as a business development manager and I am the lead for uh, space strategy uh, amongst other things. Well, quite a bit of uh, experience, certainly in in shipbuilding and ship repair, uh, Tyson. So uh, thanks for for sharing that. Brian, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself as well. What's your background? Well, yeah, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here and uh, talk to you gentlemen this afternoon. Um, Basically, I'm I'm a mariner, um, plain and simple. I was born and raised on Long Island and uh, grew up basically commercial fishing, surfing. Really, the the water, to be honest, is uh, all I've ever known. And I'm a graduate of SUNY Maritime College. And uh, after I graduated there, I worked in uh, New York Harbor on some ATBs, um, pushing petroleum products around. I got a master of towing from there. And then uh, moved to the bigger side of things with the uh, deep water subsea construction aspect of uh, drilling in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, Guyana. So it's uh, to keep it simple, it's basically me. It's, uh, you know, been fortunate enough to be a mariner all my life and, uh, made a living from it. So really can't imagine doing anything else. Well, great. Well, thank you for sharing that. And um, uh, certainly interesting uh, background and uh, nice to know uh, a fellow uh, New Yorker. Yes, sir. Tyson, why, why don't you get us uh, started and uh, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing as far as, uh, do you see a growing business case for, for OSB supporting both government and, and commercial space flight. Yeah, yeah, we're uh, we're seeing a lot of um, activity, in in with this this new type of offshore support su- uh, vessel OSV. The past decade, there's been dramatic innovations with commercial space flight. There's uh, we're on the dawn of a uh, a new space age, and NASA has plans to return to the moon as many of you know, and uh, there's multiple commercial companies uh, that are planning uh, manned missions to Mars. And there's a big business case for commercial space flight. And it's it's transitioning more from, uh, previously it was a very governmental run business. Uh, you had the likes of NASA and uh, basically governments of large countries. In the past decade, costs have gone down dramatically. Uh, so the space shuttle, as everybody knows, you know, it was one of the first reusable rockets. But even with the space shuttle in the 1990s, to put payload into space, it cost 30000 around $30,000 uh, per pound. And so now um, it's about $1,200 per pound. So costs have fallen uh, dramatically. 
And as those costs have fall, uh, interest in space exploration have gone up for the likes of communication satellites, research, deep space exploration, and uh, even space tourism. And uh, so the, this, is, this is really being made possible because a lot of these parts are being recovered offshore. So offshore plays uh, a major role in this new uh, space age. And uh, we wouldn't see the costs dropping as dramatically as they are without uh, these uh, these OSVs that are specifically designed to go out there. And instead of, you know, designed as uh, our traditional uh, OSVs for um, oil and gas uh, support operations, these are designed to support a new type of operation, which is basically space operations. Uh, space operations offshore, whether it's uh, launch uh, operations, uh, recovery operations, or um, launch and recovery operations. Brian, I, I was just going to say now, space perspective, of course, is is quite a bit different from, say, your your ATB experience in, in New York Harbor. Tell us a little bit about uh, uh, space perspective, and and Tyson's kind of given you a nice lead in here. Yes, thank you for that, Tyson. Um, so basically, Space Perspective is the world's first carbon neutral space flight experience company. And in that, that offers a safe journey to the stratosphere via a giant space balloon and our luxury spacecraft, uh, spaceship Neptune. So, you know, it, it does open up the doors to a lot of people um, that would never really necessarily have the chance to go to the moon on a, on a rocket via NASA or a, so have you, a couple different companies. You know, it, it just opens the doors in general to uh, a lot more people seeing this uh, amazing planet. Yeah, that's a good point, Brian. Um, and previous when we were talking, uh, I believe you said, what was it, like 750, only 750 or less than 800 yeah. people have even been to space? Yeah, it's been less than 800 people total um, since the start of this. And, uh, you know, that's going to go up significantly. The tremendous interest that we've had so far is just extremely overwhelming. And it's not just in the United States, but but worldwide. I mean, they've got this technology immediately, you know. Now, Tyson, how is how is ABS supporting Space Perspective? Right. Um, well, Space Perspective, uh, their OSV is, uh, is specifically uh, designed to launch the, this uh, capsule. Uh, and so they're basically uh, using the offshore space to take their clients out and um, and give them a, a perspective from space of Earth. And so what ABS does is we assist in the conversion of that. They, they took a, um, a an OSV that was originally designed and constructed for doing traditional OSV type operations that support oil and gas. They converted this to do this very specific operation, which, I mean, the risk profile is different. It doesn't make sense to, um, you know, have a lot of the equipment that they had on there. And then they had to add some uh, additional equipment and uh, change uh, some of the safety profile uh, of the of the unit. And um, so in order to do this and to, to do this safety safely, they they, um, ABS as a class society uh, reviewed their plans. Um, so uh, it's basically two steps or two stages or uh, as we would call uh, design review. So we would perform design review of uh, the changes that they made uh, to convert a, a traditional OSV to um, what we call um, what we're calling now is a space support vessel. So we do the design review and the design review is done by our engineering department basically to to check the drawings of the unit and to see that those drawings are in compliance with uh, the rules and the regulations that are applicable to the unit. And then um, we also have our our surveyors that uh, act as as inspectors and they're the boots on the ground. So they make sure that the modifications to the space support vessel are being done in compliance with those drawings and with, uh, you know, all the, the all the modifications are done in compliance with rules and regulations. Um, you know, drawings are drawings. Not everything is necessarily on the drawings. They, they will issue basically the final certificates to the vessel and uh, certifying that that vessel is... Uh, is uh, classed by ABS. And then we also perform some activities on behalf of the flag as a recognized organization. Uh, the USA is 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 a global leader for um, 
commercial space flight. And so you, the U.S. Coast Guard is a big player um, in uh, safety and compliance. We team up with the Coast Guard to uh, make sure that they're uh, they're complying with some of the Coast Guard regulations. And uh, so that that's, you know, the 30,000 foot view, so to speak, of what we were doing. Uh, I could go in more detail, but um, basically we make sure that the vessel is uh, ready uh, for this uh, new and really uh, uh, adventurous uh, type of operation that they're about to uh, uh, undertake. We uh, and, and, and we really stick to just the vessel. Um, so the, actually the space capsule itself, uh, we we don't uh, certify. So it's our scope is uh, limited to the vessel and the vessel propulsion system and the fire fighting system, the safety systems and uh, navigation systems, so on, things of that nature. Now, Brian, I, <clears throat> I was wondering if you get a little bit more uh, granular on the, the modifications to the vessel itself. Tell us a little bit about, you know, the conversion process uh, at the shipyard. What what are you doing to the uh, to the vessel to make it a, a space support vessel? It's almost uh, what we're not doing to the vessel will be easier, really. But uh, yeah, to dig into it, and this is the fun stuff to me. Um, obviously, we the first thing we've done is is lengthen the vessel an extra twenty two feet, and this is to facilitate our six hundred foot balloon, and then the associated hundred and fifty to two hundred foot of rigging for the parachutes and the capsule. Um, digging a little bit deeper to the internals is we've ripped out. All of the propulsion units, including both port and starboard Z drives, uh, the bow thruster, the drop down thruster. This also includes overhauling and um, rebuilding the associated engines that run those individual thrusters. Um, we've completely rebuilt the three ship service generators and the uh, vessel's emergency diesel generator. So, as you can see, uh, we're not taking it lightly on the propulsion side of things. Um, <clears throat> we took out you know, being, a, being an OSV, we took out the entire liquid mud system uh, that was used to support the oil field and, and that industry itself. Uh, we did convert some old liquid mud tanks into additional ballast tanks just to uh, settle the vessel in the water a little bit, give us a deeper draft. We've added additional 12-man accommodations below deck as well. Um, we can get into a little bit of the, the wiring. We've basically fully rewired the entire vessel, including the propulsion system and all of the emergency systems associated with those systems. Um, this includes a vessel monitoring system, which aids in the vessel's automation for ballast and fuel. And uh, they've really protected the vessel with a brand new state-of-the-art fire detection and control system, which uh, ABS has, has uh, full capacity over. We've added additional watertight doors for uh, compartmentalization and just make the, making the vessel overall safer for the crew that we have, the additional crew members that we will have, and then the additional passengers in the future. Safety is uh, in utmost of importance for me specifically. And uh, I told everybody that from, you know, from day one coming in, that I'm a safety nut. You know, it's, <laughs> there's a lot riding, you know, on, on my shoulders. And, uh, you know, being the, the captain of this first vessel for this company, it, it's a tremendous amount of responsibility, and I'm not going to take it lightly. And I'm glad I have the support. You know, we're not cutting any corners, hence why we're fully operational with ABS. And uh, But yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it as far as the uh, the modifications. You know, we, we can go into severe detail, but uh, we, we've upgraded everything that we can. And uh, still for some additional modifications to come in the future. Now, Brian, is she, is she also going to be... Uh, uh... Uh, DP2 or, or? Yes, we are keeping the DP2 class. So she will be fully um, utilized and operational as a DP2. You know, on that that, that topic of safety, uh, safety, you know, we talk about safety a lot. It, it's a buzzword. And um, I, I, I fear sometimes the word gets maybe a little bit worn out. And uh, it's great to work with uh, partners that, you know, safety is just, it's not just a word. Uh, and at ABS, uh, safety it's it's our guiding north star and when you have companies doing something this innovative safety and and innovation sometimes those things um can be uh, a little bit in tension because you know, nobody's done it before and uh so it's very important to have you know your best people on it and and 
and the best, um, you know, the, the, get get the best advice that you can beforehand, and and to do the risk assessments, to do the uh, design review, to do um, and to cooperate with um, with the class society and uh, to really pursue safety with uh, with all uh, due diligence and with all that that you have because um, like I said I mean OSV uh, OSV supporting uh, oil and gas operations has been done for a long time and so now this is OSV supporting space operations and so that's where uh, space uh, perspective and ABS have, have come together to really value what's new here and what's different here and can all of these risks be addressed uh, to promote safety on board that vessel and for that crew and for the people on board that vessel because that's really what matters is um, that they make it home and that they make it home to their families and uh, so that's something that's important to me personally that's the reason i work at abs well thanks for that tyson i, I was going to say could you elaborate a little bit on you know submit perhaps some of the requirements you you've developed for the design and construction and inspection of these uh, space support vessels the way that we deal with novel designs is so there are no uh, specific requirements for space support vessels right now there's just not in enough of them and uh but it is like round peg square hole kind of thing like if if a requirement doesn't make sense then then it doesn't make sense if there's no value there if it's not adding you know what i call safety value to the unit then um we need to rethink it and we need to work with all the stakeholders to examine the requirements and see that all of the potential hazards that exist are being addressed and it's all about what is the hazard how severe is it and what's the likelihood of that uh, event occurring and you know we want all events everything to get down to uh, what's known as um, uh, in the industry as ALARP as low as reasonably practicable and so uh, and, and and so this is basically in line with industry standards with industry norms you know it's basically there's nothing that's a hundred percent safe you get in your car and every day people don't realize that there's risk there's risk in everything that we do but is it acceptable risk that's the question is it acceptable risk and has the risk been mitigated to appropriate levels so that's what we do as a class society with our partners and with our clients uh, that it, that was our mission uh, with all all major modifications or modifications and uh, that was our uh, mission with this uh, project as well now, Brian, earlier you had mentioned, of course, the, the spaceship Neptune and, and the capsule and the hydrogen balloon. And, of course, meaning you're, you're going to have to carry uh, hydrogen on, on board the, the vessel. You know, to talk a little bit about, I guess, that process, um, you know, is there any concerns about risks from the hydrogen? I mean, just in general, addressing that question is yes, you know. We are going to be fully regulated by the uh, the DOT. So as far as the carriage and storage of hydrogen in itself, the balloon is powered by hydrogen. We are you know, going to be fully regulated. It's going to be in a fully controlled area uh, on the vessel. It'll be segregated as you know, as best we can from from people in general. And then just the uh, the filling process when we get to that for the balloon is going to be completely uh, followed step by step, you know, procedural wise. But yeah, just the, the carriage of, of hydrogen, the vessel itself will be extremely uh, stringent as far as our rules that we put in as a company. And then uh, along with ABS, you know, the Coast Guard, the FAA and the Department of Transportation in, in general. And then as, as far as uh, how does the how does the launching process work and, and why do you have to be off offshore to do it? Well, I'll touch on that the question first. Um, offshore, just it opens our weather pattern that we call it up. Um, obviously the earth is covered with more than 70% of water. So it gives us the ability to move around freely. Um, this is a fair weather operation. So we can literally move the vessel to different areas, you know, within a day or two or maybe a couple of days, depending on how far we go or where we go. Uh, but it just opens up the possibility to, to get these test flights first, um, off the ground, prove proof of concept and just, just opens it up. Um, we got to kind of get out of the commercial airspace as well, which is, you know, obviously very stringent over over land. But yeah, basically to uh, answer that question in its simplest form is just it, it allows us a lot more flexibility to station this vessel 
in calmer areas. Um, may that be the Bahamas or just in the middle of the uh, the Atlantic somewhere. Yeah, the, I mean, the vessel itself is going to carry out the launch and retrieval operations. Um, we have a state-of-the-art launching system, which I really can't go into, so forgive me. But that will aid in retrieval of the spacecraft and the balloon from the sea. We have a couple fast boats that will aid in that as well. And then a uh, a large A-frame and retrieval hardware on the vessel itself that will aid in recovery of the capsule and the balloon. And she's, she's basically our, our marine spaceport where this function is going to take place from. So we will launch off the deck of the vessel, uh, send the capsule and balloon into the stratosphere. And uh, a couple hours later, when she returns to the water, we'll aid in the retrieval of the, the capsule and the balloon. Well, sounds pretty exciting. Uh, when will we see the, the first of these flights? So we're, it's all dependent on us getting out of the shipyard, first of all, which we are nearing the end of it. Uh, we have a giant certification process to go through with our COI. Realistically, we're going to commence test flights in 2024. That will probably carry us through the majority of the year. Uh, we have several test flights, again, like I stated, and uh, passenger flights are now set for 2025. So we're, we're ramping up. We got a long road ahead of us, and uh, we're really looking forward to getting out of this yard, as you could imagine, and uh, moving along, really starting the fun stuff, you know. Shipyards are fun and all, but I'm ready to go home. <laughs> <laughs> I got to give my guys a little bit of a break. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Well, good. I was going to say, <clears throat> now, with only a few minutes left in our podcast, uh, Tyson, I, I was wondering if you had any final thoughts you could share with our listeners regarding possibly the outlook for OSB supporting projects like uh, like Brian's and and space uh, perspective right um well the outlook for commercial space flight is is very favorable you know uh, since 2018 I'm just uh, going to m to my notes here FAA launch licenses for commercial space flight have increased uh, 300 percent since 2018. And offshore recovery of reusable rockets, uh, th that has grown since 2016. There was just a few. And in 2022, there was over 60. Offshore plays a key role uh, in this new space age. I'll tell you why. I, I already got into recovering those parts, rapid reusability of uh, these vehicles and uh, vehicle parts such as fairings uh, and that how that is driving down prices. But what I haven't spoke to yet is uh, demands for spaceports. And spaceports, uh, there's only so many spaceports in the U.S. and globally. And uh, so that's causing bottleneck issues. There's some regulatory uh, constraints to uh, launch uh, on, on shore that uh, do not exist if you launch offshore. And uh, so as congestion grows at existing sites, it makes, you know, uh, operating a spaceport at sea uh, more attractive. So what you're going to see is as space flight, as it grows and grows and grows, units to support that, OSVs to support that are is going to grow proportionally. And uh, we expect that to continue uh, into the future. Well, thanks for that, Tyson. I, I was going to say, how about you, Brian? Do you have any uh, final parting thoughts uh, for our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, just as a whole, I'm extremely excited to see this endeavor take off. Um, as you know, Tyson mentions, just the the amount of of vessels that's just going to allow to operate, you know, in this industry specifically speak on on us. I mean, this is our first vessel, the Voyager, which I'll, I'll touch on the name. I think that's pretty important to touch on real quick. Mm. But uh, <clears throat> before that, I mean, our our first single vessel turns into two, two becomes four, and four becomes eight, and and so on, so on, um, relatively quick. You know, within the next couple of years, we're going to be spreading worldwide. There's a lot of interest globally, as I touched on before, um, specifically Australia and Hawaii, I mean, they want this now. So we're, we're trying the best to give it to them, obviously. And uh, yeah, just in general, seeing this take off and, and seeing our, our blood, sweat and tears really come to life, you know, and not, not just the vessel side either, the entire company, um, the capsule, you know, manufacturer, the balloon, um, our APC company, you know, just to see everybody's efforts and again, the blood, sweat and tears really come to life is it's going to be really something special. Yeah, touching on the Voyager, I just wanted to uh, pay a little bit of homage to uh, the vessel was named Voyager specifically for Voyager 1 space probes mission and uh, astronomer Carl Sagan's request. They took a, a photo from Earth or to uh, Earth uh, from across the solar system and they labeled that the pale blue dot. 
So that's it's kind of where the, the Voyager's name came from. And uh, the pale blue dot is basically iconically known, you know, from Carl Sagan's request to take that picture, you know, across the, uh, the solar system, actually understand how small we are, you know, and it's we got to kind of take care of this thing that we know as Earth in general. So it's, it's pretty significant. It's, it's a meaningful vessel, you know, to me specifically, and just even more that, uh, you know, I get a, to be a part of it, to be the, the first captain of this vessel. It's a special vessel, special company, and uh, we're doing a special thing. Great. Thank you for, for sharing that, Brian. And um, I look forward to seeing the first of these uh, special vessels out, out in the water uh, real soon. You're welcome uh, aboard anytime. Well, Brian and Tyson, I, I certainly want to thank you both for, for joining me today on Setting Course in ABS podcast and um, detailing uh, this uh, groundbreaking uh, project with uh, a very unique uh, space support vessel. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Thanks, John. Thank you for joining us today on Setting Course in ABS podcast. If you're interested in learning more about today's topic or listening to more episodes, visit www.eagle.org.